On the phone, it's a pleasure to welcome to the program Professor Craig Stephen Wilder of MIT, uh, author of the new book, Ebony and Ivy, Race, Slavery, and the Troubled History of American University. Uh, welcome to the program, Professor. I'm glad to be here with you, and thank you. So this is a book that was 10 years in the making. Uh, talk to us about uh, what you set out to do uh, 10 years ago. Honestly, when I started, I set out to do something much more modest, which was just to write an article about the difficulty that black abolitionists, the African-Americans, free black people in the North who opposed slavery, um, had the difficulties they had accessing higher education and a key element of their ability to make a, make an argument and, a, and to build a campaign against slavery rested on their capacity to enter the professions and to access higher education and to enter the world of ideas. And so I just wanted to write an essay about, an article about, how they got around that, how they managed to become professionals in a world where they couldn't attend college, or at least in a nation where they couldn't attend college. And then I, that led me to become just much more interested in the deep, tense, troubled, and conflicted relationship between colleges, slavery, um, and, er, and early American history, the way that the college was not just an innocent bystander, an innocent institution in that world, but it helped to shape that world. And what would, when you started with that, uh, when you set out to write that piece, I mean, what was your, uh, it, it was based on the assumption, obviously, and not just the assumption, but the historical record, that it was difficult um, uh, for these uh, African Americans to to get into the university. What was your assumption at that point? I mean, was it simply that, that delineation between sort of the, the, the uh, a passive versus an active role in supporting uh, the institution of slavery? Yeah, I, I tended to actually, I probably did think that the, um, the exclusion was more passive than active. It, it, it emerged out of a body of traditions and the deference of the academy to the ruling social order. Um, and, you know, there are these incredible stories. There's a young um, black man, James McCune Smith in Manhattan, who as a teenager in his late teens is put on a boat in the early 1830s, a ship, and he's sent to Scotland, where in five years he earns three degrees, the bachelor's, the master's, and the doctor of medicine at the University of Glasgow. And he returns one of the best trained physicians in in New York and, and establishes a medical practice and a pharmacy. Um, but these are the extraordinary lengths that these young men and young women were going through to access education. And I did think at the beginning that the, the American colleges were excluding um, largely because they deferred to the greater racial civilization. But as I looked more and more into it, you could see actually colleges as actors. You could see them shaping that world rather than just surrendering to it. Yeah, I, and I want to get to that because it's, it is, um, it, it's, 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 the, one of the things that I really find fascinating about your book is the sort of the 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 aggressive nature of the use of colleges in mm -hmm. the colonization yeah. of uh, it, at first yeah. it's uh, Native Americans uh, in this country, mm -hmm. and I want to get I want to get to that um, yeah. In, yeah. In, in, a, in a moment. But the um, the 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 notion, I guess, and, and, and obviously also how uh, the, the, the issue of, of Scotland being somewhat ironic as it, as it, as it comes back I into. Mm -hmm. um, but let's, let's, let's start just by, by talking about what that, the, that relationship was in terms of, of, of slavery and in, in, in building and both building the colleges uh, and in perpetrating the sort of, I guess, the intellectual foundations mm -hmm. of slavery at that time. Sure. And I, I think there's a way to think about this. Um, and the, the American colleges have multiple relationships to slavery. The first and most significant, the one that actually I think most of us think about when they, most people will think about when they hear the title of the book, is actually the relationship between um, colleges and the slave trade. Uh, the rise of the Atlantic slave trade, the African slave trade in the Atlantic world, allows for and ultimately funds the institutional development of the colonies, including colleges. And so almost from the beginning of the American colonies in New Spain, the Spanish colonies in New France, and in the British colonies, um, New England, the Mid-Atlantic, and the American South, um, the ability to actually institution build 
was closely tied to the rise of the slave trade. And you can actually see this in the middle of the 18th century, between 1746 and 1769, when the number of colleges in the British colonies triples from three to nine. The first three are Harvard in Massachusetts, William and Mary in Virginia, and Yale in Connecticut. And then there's six colleges built in less than 25 years. But that's precisely the moment when the African slave trade reaches its peak. And these new colleges are actually, the boards of these new colleges are filled with merchants who are engaged in the slave trade or engaged in the trade to provision the slave colonies in, in the South and in the West Indies. I mean, on, on one level, I mean, and um, it, it, it seems almost... It's, uh, on one level, you know, when, when at, at first, I guess there's a sort of a, a, a predisposition to assume that the... Uh, that you you associate the the rise of these universities with the Enlightenment and uh, and, mm-hmm. and, and you know the the idea that there would be uh, a a more enlightened vision of of uh, other human beings I guess mm-hmm. uh, on the other hand it's sort of uh, it, it seems like almost everything that developed in this country at that time was in some way at least financed or you know. Uh, secondarily financed by the raise, uh, uh, rise of, of 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 the slave trade. I mean, uh, right, right. Uh, and I think actually one of the striking things that you, I hope people will take away from the book, is actually colleges provide an extraordinary lens for looking at and rethinking the 17th and 18th century Atlantic world and the centrality of slavery to that world. I think you're absolutely right about that. And there is a sort of an assumption that one can make that, you know, everything in that world um, is closely tied to slavery. But in the case of colleges, you can go a little further with the argument. It's not just that they're of that world, because that actually leaves colleges as sort of passive participants in the trade and in human slavery. Um, the It's actually that the colleges are pursuing wealth in that world. It's precisely, you know, the... Um, at Princeton, then the College of New Jersey, at Columbia, then King's College, at Harvard and at Yale, they're sending out ambassadors to the West Indies to solicit students and donations. Um, One of the key presidents of the College of New Jersey, John Witherspoon, who comes from Scotland in 1768 to take over what's a struggling, in fact, failing college, um, one of the first things he does is actually publish a missive to the West Indies promising planters that their sons will be taken care of very carefully and dutifully guided into manhood if they're sent to Princeton, um, while in other parts of the world they might be neglected or exploited. Um, And so, you know, the American colleges actually don't just live in a world with slavery. They actually um, do everything that they can to, or the survival of these colleges depends upon their ability to exploit that trade and that institution. I, and I, I want to I want to jump uh, like, I guess uh, just to go uh, uh, back uh, a little bit in history from from that moment because the dynamic with the West Indies seems to be that's where the money is uh, right. and right. and and because that's where we're soliciting the money we must um, we must make our universities amenable to the predispositions of those who have that money right. but but. When the colleges are first formed, you I mean, you refer to them almost as uh, I mean you say uh, I think uh, chapter one is colleges in the arsenal of of imperialism, as if these are a a form of weapon for colonization. Yeah, T- yeah. talk about and I, you know sure sure I you know I make the argument that in fact actually the early role of the college in the colonial world is to facilitate and accelerate conquest. Um, that colleges are deployed, and part of their mission is to evangelize indigenous people, um, to bring them to Christianity, both for religious reasons, but also for strategic reasons. And the two things, you know, um, often there's no differentiation between the two, because the expectation is that as indigenous people get Christianized, they will actually come under the governance of Christians. Um, There'll be strategic advantages to that. Um, And so the the colleges get deployed in that way. And one of the reasons I actually moved in that direction in both my own research and my thinking about that early part of the book and how to write that early story was actually just looking at the history of colleges in England and the British Empire. Because in the centuries just before the founding of Harvard, 
um, we have to remember that England began to establish universities in Scotland and Ireland for the purpose of rooting out the remnants of Catholicism, for making um, royal and colonial control and governance simpler, and for pacifying the, the people of these colonized societies. Yeah, and 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 it's um and, and and my understanding is that you know you have these um uh the I guess the these I don't know educators or these these uh, these <laughs> men who want to establish these colleges they need uh, money uh, they go to England and find uh, uh, that that the idea of um, using the university as a form of bringing these Native Americans within the context of, of Christianity is their best selling point. Was, was, right. It, 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 and, and was that also part of, I mean, was that their agenda or was it, you know, this is the way that we're going to get the cash? Uh, my heart's only it, part. It, yeah. Yeah, no, I, you know, and I think it's easy to be cynical about them. And I, and I try not to. I, you know, I really did struggle with this to try and see the, the desire for the Christianization and for the spread of Christianity to be both sincere and strategically necessary. Um, and I think we often draw a sort of false division between the two. It has to be one or the other. And in fact, actually, that's the division I reject. I actually think that they can be sincere and be pursuing strategic advantages at the same time. Now, there is a period, certainly by the 18th century, when the new colleges are being built in the, in the, sen in the quarter century, the 25 years before the American Revolution, um, there is a period then when they're sending ambassadors to England, um, to Britain, under the claim that they're evangelizing Native people and using Native people to raise money. And it's, in fact, actually quite cynical. Um, at one point in the book, I point out, you know, they're, they're, some of these guys are literally just bumping into each other, soliciting the same wealthy don donors from royals to rising merchants. Um, under the claim that they're evangelizing Native people, and when in fact, actually, there are virtually no Native students on their campuses, and they're not particularly interested in um, recruiting Native students. And re you have to remember that what happens just before this is the Seven Years' War, um, from 1754 to 1763, the French and Indian War in North America. Um, and there, it, one of the legacies is um, rising hostility and an increasingly racialized hostility toward Native people. So we're raising money to educate them, or at least under that claim, at the same time that there's, in fact, extraordinary hostility toward Native people on a lot of these campuses. And, and, and in fact, um, Harvard, the first uh, brick building, um, mm -hmm. you, you, yeah. you note, was... Um, uh, what was the, what, what did they call it? it was, it was specific. It was the Indian college. It, it was, was the it, Indian college. And yeah, the Indian college is the first brick building. Yeah. yeah. And, and, it, and the first, uh, is it, I, did I read this correctly that the first, um, the first sort of, I guess, recorded, uh, slave, was it in the country? Was it Harvard? No, not in the country, but, um, actually one of the earliest slaves recorded in New England, um, is a man referred to in the record as the Moor, um, who is brought to Massachusetts somewhere around 1638. Harvard is just established two years earlier, and it's forced to close for a year shortly after it's established. And when it reopens, um, it reopens basically with um, this man, the Moor, on campus who's owned by um, Master Eaton, who's the um, instructor of the students at the school, the, the primary instructor of the students at the school. And so one of the earliest residents of Harvard Yard is actually an enslaved person. And this is the beginning of slavery in New England. Um, and so I write in the book that the dawn of slavery in New England is also the birth of slavery at Harvard. And um, let's let's turn to and I, and I want to come back to the the idea of uh, the university being deployed as, as a mm -hmm. because it it's it's a it, it seems to me that dynamic has ramifications obviously through history in terms of colonization but also as you know even today in in sort of I guess less nefarious ways but uh, but before we do uh, talk to us about the 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 way that um, the the Scottish immigrants uh, and their migration to the United States um, uh, forms uh, ideas of of race in this country and it's ones that we're I think we're still very much living with today when you look at sort of the <laughs> electoral politics in this country right 
Yeah, and if you think about, you know, early colleges, the first colleges in the Americas were actually in New Spain, and they're founded actually 100 years before Harvard. The first of them is um, founded in the 1530s. Harvard is founded in the 1630s, a century later. Um, the first colleges, I argue, in that early chapter are actually um, largely there. Um, one of their major roles is to facilitate the evangelization of indigenous people um, in South America, Central America, the West Indies, and the North American mainland. Um, the second wave of colleges that I talked about just a bit ago, the ones who are found, the ones that are founded in the um, quarter century before the American Revolution, uh, and this includes Princeton, the University of Pennsylvania, Columbia, Brown, Rutgers, and Dartmouth, um, that group of colleges actually has a somewhat different role. Um, and they're founded you know, from the 1740s on, and by that time, um, in most of those regions, the great military struggle between Native American nations and the colonists has been decided. The colonists have actually achieved military supremacy um, on the Atlantic seaboard. And what these new colleges begin doing is they actually help to bind together, one of their key functions, is they begin to help to bind together the colonists, um, European colonists of very different backgrounds, with deep religious divisions and deep ethnic and national divisions. Um, Germans and, and Germans in the Pennsylvania backcountry who arrive, many of them, as indentured servants in the decade before the American Revolution, Scots and Scots-Irish, um, both in Pennsylvania, Virginia, the Carolinas, some of whom, many of whom arrive as indentured servants and become free over time, and unifying those colonists into a coherent group of people requires, in fact, articulating a vision for the future of the colonies um, and a language for um, seeing both a common history and a common destiny. And I argue in the book that colleges are actually one of the key institutions for providing this. And one of the ways that they do it is they take the, um, the social uh, descriptions of race, the ideas that the colonists had begun to form about their relationship to other people in the Americas, but also throughout the world. And colleges become the places that refine these ideas and give them intellectual legitimacy using the language um, and the structures of theology and science. And so what, 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 what did those, um, what did, I mean, what, how did they break down? In other words, what, what, what was the, those, those definitions? I mean, was it a, a simp I mean, on, on some level, I mean, we have this huge slave trade, which creates sort of a, uh, a web of trade and a web of, mm -hmm. of development. And sure. uh, the university plays, plays the, the role you just expressed, I guess, in, in sort of creating right. some type right. of cohesion for the colonists. And that's by defining, basically defining all of those white colonists as, uh, as superior to... Uh, yeah, African and, and it... it, it it becomes, I, I use in the chapter that really deals with this directly, I, deal, I describe it as the whitening of um, whole regions of North America. And what I mean by that is the colonists increasingly see themselves as unified, and the symbol of their unification, the symbol of their common history and destiny, becomes the color of their skin, mm -hmm. which also means that they're, decre they're not emphasizing the religious and national cleavages, the linguistic cleavages that had actually um, uh, defined their identities earlier. And so rather than being Germans and Scots, um, Presbyterians and Anglicans, um, you know, uh, the remnants of the Puritans, the Congregationalists, um, and, and Swedes, uh, they increasingly come to see themselves as white people. Two really quite wonderful Native American historians, historians of Native Americans, um, argued some time ago that you know the ideas that get formed to defend the slave trade in the 17th and 18th century ultimately get deployed to racialize Native Americans. Um, but I, I also add to that that, in fact, those ideas move unbound through Western thought, and they begin to accelerate in the 18th century, particularly as they gain intellectual legitimacy. And so if whiteness is, a, is a, the symbol of the unification of these regions and their peoples under a common history and a common destiny, it also becomes an expression of an assertion of their supremacy and their superior right to both the land, the territory, and the, and one vision of the future. This is a dynamic, I think, that obviously continues to play out in um, in 
in uh, in America and probably in, in other societies as well. I mean, this idea that the 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 melting pot was um, create to the extent that it existed, it was it needed on some level sort of the fire, if you will, of 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 uh, racial inferiority or superiority to, to sort of to, to, to heat up that cauldron, right, and bring everybody together. Right. Well, in fact, actually, exclusion becomes one of the dynamics of inclusion, right? Um, you, you, we create the nation also by defining who can't belong to it. Um, and that definition is not just a rhetorical one. It also rests upon the roles that various populations of people will play in the construction of the new nation. Um, the exclusion of Native Americans also, in fact, means the conquest, the final, uh, finishing the project of conquering Native people. Um, and the exclusion of people of African descent also means the continuation of a um, economy based upon uh, their labor um, and the forced extraction of their labor. And, and was this something that was um, manifested in the curriculum of the colleges at this time? Yeah, yeah. And so one of the things that I really l tried to do in the book was to show not just that these ideas had emerged and not just that colleges had become sites for refining these ideas um, and, and returning them to the public with a kind of intellectual legitimacy. But one of the things I wanted to do in the book was really look at the ways in which students learned um, race and practiced race on campus. And you can actually see this. The very beginning of the book, the introduction, is a story of a young Connecticut um, man, Henry Watson, Jr., who goes to what's, Trinity, what's called Washington College at the time and is now Trinity College in Connecticut and then finishes his education at Harvard. And once he's done in the early 1830s, I think he graduates in 1830 or 1831, um, he heads south and to become a plantation tutor, to tutor the children of wealthy planters. He's going to support himself and make money to eventually attend law school by tutoring in the south. And that project actually doesn't go that well. He returns, he goes to law school, and then eventually he heads south again, and he becomes one of the leading planters of the Alabama-Mississippi region um, in his lifetime. In the decades before the Civil War, he's not just a, uh, he owns more than 100 people. Um, he owns, uh, you know, a, a rather enormous plantation, um, and he becomes a statesman, um, helping to represent and define the Southern view, the defense of slavery. And if you look at what he was learning on campus when he was at Harvard, um, one of the people he took a course with was John Collins Warren, whose father had actually established a medical school at Harvard and who was a leading uh, medical anthropologist and taught about the inferiority of the colored races of the world. Um, in fact, he got Henry Watson, Jr. got a vigorous and robust education in the scientific basis of inequality and a scientific justification for um, the unequal treatment of human beings. And, and and we, I mean, on some level, we still see the, um, I guess, the, the ripple effects of that in, in, in works like the, the bell curve. And, right. And the, the legacies of these things live with us. Absolutely. And, and why, I mean, did the, 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 the things that the, the, these ideas that were, um, dis, you know, uh, disseminated throughout the country from the graduates of these, of these colleges at that time, w did... W why did they have, did they ultimately have more re resonance in some parts of the country than others? Um, or was that a function of sort of how they supported the, the economics of the time? I mean, what, what, why was it that in some areas this stuff uh, hell, took more than others? Well, I think one of the things we have to remember is that the regions participated in the national culture um, in different ways, but not necessarily in conflicting ways. And so after slavery largely ends in the northern states, once the United States is established in, in the decades before the Civil War, um, slavery largely ends in the northern states, um, northern colleges continue to depend heavily upon the South um, for both funds and for students. Um, and northern colleges become, in fact, sites for producing a lot of the ideas that come to defend slavery. Um, northern students are still heading south. Northern intellectuals head south uh, for career opportunities. As the Southern Academy begins to expand, one of the things I do in the book is I try to show actually that the you know at the beginning of the American Revolution, there's only one college in the South, William and Mary, 
Um, there are dozens founded after that. But in fact, actually, a lot of them are founded by northerners who head south um, to basically begin the, infra- the institutional development of the southern colonies. And as a quick example, I can just give the example of William Barton Rogers, the founder of MIT, where I work right now. Rogers went to William and Mary. His father became professor of chemistry there when he was a teenager. And he and his brother actually attended college there. And then William Barton Rogers replaced his father on the faculty, had a long career in the South. He went on to teach at the University of Virginia, where he became dean of the faculty. Both colleges owned slaves. Rogers actually lived in a house, both as a student and um, as a faculty member, that was served by enslaved black people. And then in the 1850s, he eventually heads north. He he does drift toward anti-slavery and abolitionism, um, and he founds MIT here in the north. But MIT is in part the engineering schools that are established in the decades before the Civil War in the north are in part actually the incentive for establishing them is to help produce and engineer, construct um, textile manufacturing towns that are manufacturing um, cotton textile cloth, slave-grown cotton uh, from the um, south, transported north, and then manufactured into cloth. And so there are intimate economic and intellectual ties that continue between the north and the south long after slavery declines in the north. Counterfactuals are obviously a little bit tricky, but I mean, Mm -hmm. what... what if there was, I mean, what if they had not been able to get the funds for these colleges? And I'm just wondering, like, you know, to what mm-hmm. extent yeah. are these universities a, uh, I mean, there's obviously, it's very hard to parse out. To what extent these uh, universities are a reflection of the culture in which they exist in, and mm-hmm. to what extent they're they're driving it. But, right. But, right. But, but in the absence of these colleges, I mean, what, what, what could have been different? Well, I think one of the ways you can think about that is actually um, a historian of higher education a few decades ago um, gave, left us with a, a really important reminder um, that in the period before the American Civil War, hundreds of colleges were actually founded, and the, about 70 to 80 percent of them failed. Um, you know, colleges in the rugged world of the colonies and early national America survived by finding funds, sources of don- of donations, and students. Um, and lots of small towns raised up academies and advanced schools, um, but most of those projects failed. Um, and the ones that survived, um, I argue in the book, that part of their survival um, rests upon their ability to access wealth. Um, and that wealth is largely coming from the South and from the West, or, uh, and the West Indies and from the merchants of the Northeast which in the 18th century and the 17th century um, are dominated by the slave traders, but by the 19th century is increasingly dominated by the industrialists of whom the cotton manufacturers are a leading group. So, so it's almost, uh, in other words, it, 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 it's, it was so systemic that <laughs> universities couldn't have existed but for their adoption of of I guess the, you know driving this uh, this culture then this belief right. yeah. system that justified slavery, yeah. and and you know you can actually see this you know my colleague Sven Beckert at Harvard is actually is producing a extraordinary study that we're all anticipating of cotton, um, and you know but cotton is the single largest export of the United States in the years before the Civil War, um, and when you add in sugar, um, tobacco, and indigo. Um, the American economy rests heavily upon the products of slavery in the South. And so there are intimate ties between the rise of northern manufacturing and southern slavery. And in many ways, actually, colleges are a perfect site for um, revealing those connections because you can see real people moving back and forth between these regions. And you can see the way in which that movement, that, that commerce in human beings, actually shapes ideas. And and so when did it when did it turn for these colleges? I mean, it, it, it it's fascinating because it, over the course of your um, uh, researching this book, there was um, a, a sort of almost like a uh, a series of starting, I guess, at Brown of mm-hmm. of reports on the these institutions' relationship uh, with slavery right. at their founding. Um, when when did it turn for these universities as they were decoupled from slavery as a funding source or 
Yeah, you know, I think one of the things we have to remember is that slavery and anti-slavery existed on the campus campuses simultaneously. You know, one of the great contradictions of, um, or, or one of the interesting paradoxes of the um, early college is that slavery and anti-slavery coexisted for quite some time. You know, at Yale, Ezra Stiles, uh, who becomes the president during the who's the president during the Revolutionary period. Um, owns, purchases an enslaved black boy earlier in his career, names him Newport, and he emancipates him the day that he, the day before he leaves to become president of Yale. Although Newport eventually joins him in New Haven, um, Stiles then goes on to establish an abolitionist society in New Haven, of which he's the president, and which basically operates on the calendar of the college and Yale faculty, or um, participate rather um, fully. In the abolition, in that early abolitionist or anti-slavery society, and so um, slavery and anti-slavery existed on campus at the same time at the University of North Carolina in the early 19th century. Um, and it, one of the commencement addresses is actually from an abolitionist, and the um, university trustees actually publish that address and keep it in print for quite some time. One of the things that happens is in the decades before the Civil War, the tolerance for anti-slavery discourse on campus um, declines. And increasingly, there's a rather harsh reaction against, uh, a, a rather harsh and violent attempt to stomp out anti-slavery discourse and abolitionist discourse from American campuses, in part in defense of these economic ties, um, in an attempt to cultivate them and maintain them. And one can see this in a rather extraordinary and violent moment at Amherst College in Massachusetts in 1835 at their commencement when a young undergraduate from Tennessee pulls out a club and begins beating a classmate from New Hampshire over that New Hampshire student's abolitionist views. Mm -hmm. um, he bludgeons him. Wow. Um, and and so, uh, and lastly, I just want to get back to this, uh, the idea, because of the, the, the concept of these colleges being used, um, I, I mean, I think you, you referred to them as weapons of social destruction. And mm -hmm. I wonder if today we see, I mean, you know, uh, I spent a lot of time talking about the education reform movement in this country, but uh, the idea of education being used um, specifically, and the way that it's funded, mm -hmm. being used to pursue an, an agenda. And I, you know, I don't know mm -hmm. that it is as explicitly um, uh, that it's, I don't know exactly what those agendas are, per se. I right. mean, I think there's right. a certain corporatization. But it's interesting to, to see that dynamic where the funding of, of educational institutions uh, serve as much as a, a a cudgel and a spear in some ways. Uh, mm -hmm. where, yeah. Do you, I mean, do you have a sense of of education as being used that way in other aspects? Yeah, you know, I think in the in the book, one of the things I point out is that the early college is an instrument of colonialism. It accelerates that project, and it's one of the, it's a key ingredient in the destruction of um, Native American nations in the Americas, right? Um, it, it's part of the, um, the apparatus of conquest and colonialism. When we draw analogies to the present, the one I think that's safest to draw is actually the one, the takeaway from me after 11 years of working on this project. I struggled with how to talk about universities. You know, I went to these schools. Um, as a kid from Brooklyn, New York, um, you know, the, a first-generation college student, these schools changed my life. They changed my sister's life. You know, they gave us all sorts of extraordinary opportunities. Um, you know, I, I sit now as the chair of the history department at MIT because of these schools. And so I wrestled with how to talk about them and how to describe them. Um, and one of the things that I, the takeaway for me after 11 years was um, I had to be honest about what social institutions are. They're just social institutions, and they're capable of great good, and they're also capable capable of extraordinary destruction. Um, but they do the tasks that we assign them, and that's, I think, the current um, lesson that we need to learn. You know, that as we talk about schools and as we talk about education, um, the question of how they get deployed and what they get de deployed to do matters. Um, who's deploying them? 
um, who's in charge, and ultimately what the project is matters. And I think we have to spend a lot more um, of our political, social, and intellectual energy thinking about not the structure of the schools, um, but the the nature of the project that they're engaged in. And in, in many respects, that's a, a function of their funding. Yeah, it's a function of funding. It's the disempowerment of um, low-income people and poor communities in the decision-making process, the rise of you know consultancy and, and a new kind of expertise that tends to either discredit or uh, muffle the voices of parents and communities, um, teachers, etc. You know, the ease with which we attack teachers, I think, is troubling to me. And this is not what my book is about, but it's certainly, you know, what what one of the takeaway lessons that I have from it. Um, and when I think about contemporary society and contemporary education, yeah, absolutely, it's about money, it's about power, um, and it's about what are the objectives of American society. Um, what matters to us as people and as citizens. Craig Stevens Wilder, the book is Ebony and Ivy, Race, uh, Slavery, and the Troubled History of American Universities. Thanks so much for your time today. I uh, really appreciate it. Thank you. I really appreciate your time.